Excellent. And thank you for letting me have a meditation. It's guided at the beginning, but I'll become quiet. <laughs> I really enjoy my meditation. And even though I'm talking, I'm also meditating when I'm talking to you. And that gives me so much peace and recharges my energy levels. So thank you. So now, if you can sit as comfortably as you possibly can. Oh, I'll sit like this. And if you can, close your eyes. There may still be people coming in, going out, but please don't allow the sounds to disturb you. The sounds which people make, they last such a short time. But what really disturbs us is the response we make in our own mind. The thoughts, the complaints. So see if you can stay in this moment. It's all you ever have is right now. It's like opening the door of your heart to this moment, no matter what it is. Sometimes I call that unconditional mindfulness. Just aware right now. Or whatever it is, I let it come in. But I'm always clear not to own whatever I experience. It's a visitor to my mind. You can hear a few coughs. They're just visiting this present moment. But they don't stay. And when they disappear, I still have my mindfulness left. And the mindfulness of what happens after the cough. Like the mindfulness I have looking at the hall with my eyes open. I see the space between people rather than the people themselves. And the space in this hall is so big you may say this hall is full, but the space is always much bigger. And when we can respect that space between people, between you and others, we're grateful for it, we're kind to it. It's like we create kindness to fill all the empty spaces in the world. And that kindness makes us all feel safe, connected. We fill this room with kindness. When I do that, my whole body starts to relax. I can feel my tummy. It's just had a few swigs of coffee. That's my little gift for my tummy. May you enjoy the taste. May bloodstream, you take up the energy so I can serve. And I always try to respond to everything I feel with the good qualities of kindness and generosity and mudita, this appreciation of all the kindness which has been shown to me today and before. When I can feel that kindness and that service which so many people have given, 
that brings me this deep sense of peace inside. And I value peace so much. Remember those three bows? The second one was to peace. I value peace, I worship peace. So when I see peace inside of me, I get to feel what it's like, peace. And I respect it, it's like I bow down to it. I respect it so much. It's a peace which relaxes my body and gives me good health. Gives me strength. And surprisingly, I'm just describing how I feel right now. That peace brings up joy. It's wonderful happiness to know that things have now quietened down. And I know that I will just not interfere, I will not strive. My body will quieten down by itself. My body quietens down. My mind will become energized. Beautiful, poised energy. And that will allow me to see, see inside, be really clearly mindful of what meditation is. It's like pausing, stopping in all the things which you do in your life. You stop in this moment and enjoy, appreciate what it feels like to rest. Rest in this moment. Not wanting anything in the whole world. There are two types of freedom. The freedom of desire. So you can get whatever you want. Which is an imperfect freedom or the freedom from desire where you don't want anything in the whole world desire just is not there you are happy to be here are you happy to be here right now or do you want to go somewhere else wanting to be somewhere else is called suffering Happy to be here is called freedom. So I'm going to let go. Let go of all looking for something in the future. And instead let this moment right now be I can only let this moment be as long as I don't own it. I'm just visiting so I don't attach, grab on to anything which I do not own. That makes my meditation so much lighter. You don't own this moment. You're just passing through. Please excuse me, I'm going to be quiet now. Please enjoy the meditation as best you can.
Thank you so much for being quiet. And sometimes I forget my age. I'm an old monk now. <laughs> Years ago I told the community of monks in which I live that I was getting old. And they said, no you're not. I, was, I felt so appreciated. What a kind group of people I was moving with. And the monks replied, no you're not getting old Ajahn Brahm. You're already old. <laughs> Honesty. But learning how to meditate was probably the best thing which I ever did when I was a young man. In order to be able to rest. And it works every time. Re-energize my brain. If I'd have just given a talk just at 3.30, it would have probably been hopeless. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to do this meditation right now and to find some lovely peace inside and energize. Sometimes when you're being asked many, many questions all at the same time and photographs and stuff, you know, I'm very happy to do that because out of kindness to her, I'm sorry that you, know, you had to call an end to it for you know, a few minutes. If we can do some later on, fine. But then he just needed to have a rest. And taking little bits of rest throughout the day, you find out you're far more efficient, give far better talks, and can relate to people. And I relate to my body and my mind. It's like my body says, please take a rest. And when I do that, you know, my health really improves. This is something I've told many people in my life. There are times when you get up in the morning, you do some meditation, you go for breakfast, and then you feel tired. And sometimes I go back into my cave and just lay down, have a nap. And sometimes I think, I can't do that, I'm a monk. I should put more energy and effort into my life. That's how I used to feel, but now I'm more mindful of my own body. And sometimes I feel, no, my body says, please, please take a break. I listen to my body. And when it says, you know, go and have a rest, I do that. When I do that, I know I've made the right decision. I lay down and I go to sleep almost immediately for half an hour or 40 minutes. And then afterwards, you wake up, and I feel just so good, so energized, as if my body is telling me, please take a rest. And when I do that, my body has the opportunity to relax, to rest, to heal itself. I say I've never been diagnosed with a COVID, and I think that's probably why. I've taken a COVID test, but it was all negative. I always say, in life, don't just follow what other people say and do. I know many people say, always be positive. I say, no. <laughs> if you're taking a COVID test, please be negative. And they say, you should never be attached. I said, no. If you're traveling on a motorbike in busy traffic on the back, please be attached. <laughs> little by little we learn just what these words really mean how we can be kind to ourselves and help ourselves and heal ourselves I know we're supposed to be talking about the power of stillness to create nice deep medita to create good health and wellness and I've just been doing that for just far too long it actually does work sometimes when you're very very still you know how to meditate because your mind really really still it's amazing how many diseases vanish. I remember Ajahn Chah telling me how he, how he overcame um, malaria fever. In those days, every forest monk living in the jungles would get malaria. It was just called the forest monk's disease. 
And so he said that there was one day he was once again having this bout of malaria and getting very hot in a fever. And one day he decided just to sit there and not fight it. And he described what it was like. He said it was like sitting in the middle of a forest fire, but in a cool spot where the fire couldn't burn him. You could feel the heat, but it wasn't dangerous to him. And it got hotter and hotter and hotter, but he was quite comfortable sitting like in the eye of a storm, and hotter and hotter, and then it exploded. And that was the last time he ever had um, uh, malaria fever. That was the end of it. I always remember that. So if there's any ever time you get very, very sick, instead of like fighting it, because that makes you so tense, see if you can go into the center of things. In the center of things, there you find a lot of freedom and peace. What does it mean by going into the center of things? One of those similes I haven't talked about yet is one of my favorite similes, the simile of the thousand-petaled lotus. A lotus, when it's closed up at night time, when it's closed up at night time, on the outside it's got no fragrance. You can kneel down and smell it, and you can't smell the beautiful, like aroma of a, of a lotus flower, it's scent. And the outer petals always look like a bit corrugated. They don't look beautiful, they're very thick. But when that lotus opens, it opens because of the light and the warmth of the sun. And when that light and warmth of the sun hit those outer petals of lotus, protecting all the inner petals, then they slowly open out, allowing the warmth and light of the sun to reach the next layer of petals, so they can open up. That's how you go inside the lotus. The layer of petals just opened up, allows the warmth and light of the sun to open up the next layer. And I'm sure that you've heard this simile before. The warmth of the sun stands for kindness. The light of the sun stands for mindfulness. You need both the light and the warmth of the sun. And you may even say you need the third ingredient, which is patience. And patience doesn't mean waiting for something to happen. It means waiting in this moment, like a waiter at a restaurant who's just watching. And when the customers are ready, he can serve the next course, or she can serve the next course, whoever is the waiter. And this is why when you're waiting in this moment, kind and aware, you will find the lotus opens up all by itself. And when it opens up, the deeper you go into a lotus, the deeper the layer of petals, the more thin they are, the more profound are these experiences of meditation. The more beautiful is the colorings on those lotus petals, and the more fragrant they are. And little by little you go deeper and deeper and deeper. So that's actually a great description of what meditation is. And what is that lotus? That's you, your body and mind. So you watch this with your eyes closed, with kindfulness and patience, and you find that your lotus opens up. You go into the body, and inside the body you have your mind, and that petal opens up, and the mindfulness and kindness is aware of your mind, spreading kindness onto your mind. It relaxes, and you go into its center of the mind, which is in this present moment. It's something which I've experimented with, and, and there's no, there's a lot of people understand the power of the present moment. 
but they don't understand how to let go of the past, how to let go of the future. You have to have the kindfulness there. Without being kind to the past, or kind to the future, it won't disappear from you. It will keep coming back. So when you're kind, as well as mindful, you find the past and future vanish. You go into this moment, and then you don't need to judge it. That's what words do. Give it a name, good or bad. You no, know, this is what you're supposed to be doing. You're not supposed to be doing. Please, you know, don't judge anything. When you're silent inside, you don't have this inner commentary. Then you can see more clearly. As the great Taoist monk Lao Tzu said, when one of his disciples saw a beautiful sunset and said, wow, what a beautiful sunset. And Lao Tzu criticized him for that. Why? It was a beautiful sunset. But Lao Tzu said, my disciple was watching the words, not the sunset. And that really made a big impact on me. If you say, oh, this is a nimitor, this is the breath, you're not watching the breath anymore. You're watching the descriptions, the words, which are never as accurate as watching the thing in itself. And sometimes, you know, in the deeper parts of meditation, we run out of words. It's so difficult to make descriptions of these very profound states. But anyhow, if we can stop the descriptions, have the silent mind, then the descriptions become even irrelevant and the experience becomes delightful. You're going into the lotus. And as you go deeper and deeper into the lotus, you do experience all these amazing joys and happinesses. You start to notice what we call the nimitas, first of all, these beautiful lights in the mind. Hopefully I'll be able to say more about that tomorrow. It's only a short retreat, but you can always listen to those descriptions of nimitas in some of the, uh, the talks online. And this is where you really get into the meditation. Beautiful images and lights in the mind, usually accompanied by a lot of, lot of joy. Deeper into the lotus, it gets more and more beautiful. And inside those beautiful lights in the mind, what we call the nimitas, inside of what those nimitas are, is just how you experience this thing which we call the mind, not the brain. This is the first time you become aware of what this mind actually is. Many times people think they kind of understand, but once you have lots of experience in meditation, you're really getting to know this thing, the Buddha called jitta or mind. You know the word jitta is also meaning something beautiful. It was a word used in, modern, in ordinary language as well. And as you go deeper into this, you don't decide to go deeper into this. All you ever do in meditation is to maintain the mindfulness and kindness. Nothing else. You keep quiet. You don't have a, a mind which verbalizes. And little by little, those joy in the mind that gets stronger and stronger amazing limiters. Please don't be scared. These are powerful experiences but totally safe. And there is one danger with limiters and jhanas which come next and that is you might lose your hair. <laughs> you want to become a monk or a nun. <laughs> Sorry but that's just what happens. But then as you do go deeper into these things it just happens by itself. You don't do anything. You're just watching this and it gets more and more joyful, more and more still. You come further and further away from the world and your five senses disappear. You can't feel your body. You can't hear any sound. And all the other senses disappear very easily. 
and you get into these states of meditation deep inside your lotus called the jhanas and these are beautiful the first time I know this monk very well the first time that he went into a jhana he wasn't even a monk yet and came out again afterwards one of the reflections afterwards why hasn't anybody told me about this before? That's why I tell you. You can't make that complaint. These are the biggest joys a human being can experience. Why not? And the nice part of the simile of the lotus, you are those lotuses. If you understand that simile, it's like inside each one of you, right now, these beautiful nimittas and jhanas. You don't have to get them, they're inside. Just need to go inwards, go inside with kindfulness and mindful, with kindfulness, the combination of mindfulness and kindness and patience and your mind opens up. And you go inside and that's where you find these beautiful things. And for those of you who've listened to Buddhism for so many years, the Eightfold Path, what is the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path? That's jhanas. Always says that. Maha, Maha Gopakamogalana Gopa Sutta, after the Buddha passed away, Gopakamogalana asked Ananda, who'd been the Buddha's right-hand monk for 25 years, what type of meditation did the Buddha teach? And Ananda replied, only four types of meditation. Those four types of meditation are recommended by the Buddha, not just to monks, to everybody, each one of you was the first, second, third, fourth jhana. That's what people did in those days. It can be done. Lay people do it. And this is how it's done. You get blissed out of your head. Beautiful states of mind. But it's not just for the joy of it. Because once you emerge from any of those deep meditations, it's kind of like you're walking on air. I don't mean you're levitating. You just feel so immense energy and joy and clarity of mind. So whatever you wish to contemplate, instead of contemplate, I call it like exploring, the insight part of meditation. What is that insight? Where does it come from? What's, what's this? What am I holding up? People might say a stick, a gong bonga. Yeah, but what else is it? I gave this simile, I think, over in, uh, over in Perth last week. What is this? If you think it's a gong bonga, you only see a fraction of it. I say, you know what it's also used for? <laughs> when I get an issue back. You're getting insight, seeing ways things can be used which no one has seen before. This is where the insight comes from. You go against all the boundaries which have stopped you exploring the nature of this body and this mind and seeing it more deeply. And that means you really do start to get insight. You cannot stop it. It's a natural phenomena. So because it's natural, you don't have to strive, you don't have to do it. When your mind is clear, of course you see. And I'm going to finish off and then ask for a few questions on one of my gross similes about insight. <laughs> I think Venerable Carlico knows what I'm going to say. And I think, so do you know what I'm going to say. 
I was teaching a meditation retreat over in Jhana Grove a few years ago. As I was teaching, I was also practicing. I just enjoy my meditation. So, but you can't stop me. I refuse <laughs> to be stopped. Actually, my mind refuses. So I was getting some very nice deep meditation. And then when the meditation finished, just like every other human being, I had to go to the toilet. And I remember the particular toilet cubicle in which this happened. I was doing what they call in Australia a number two. You all know what I mean? My mistake, my mistake was after I'd uh, deposited the stuff in the bottom of the bowl, instead of just pushing the button and flushing it down, I looked at it. Wow! In my whole life, I'd never seen such a beautiful, I mean, the beautiful is like underrating it. <laughs> the way all those little balls were formed together, it was like some sort of work of a Michelangelo. <laughs> you know, just, they complemented one another. It was like a work of art. And sometimes you can really appreciate sculpture. And I was looking at, this is amazing. And all, Sometimes people think it's just a brown colour. It's not. Next time you go to the loo, look a bit with a bit more mindfulness. There's different shades of brown. And just the way they were all interacted. They were balanced and sometimes contrasting a darker brown with a lighter brown. And I thought whoever managed to create that was at such an enormous understanding of the relationship of colour. <laughs> and I better not go on too long, but I can't resist. I mean, and that was just the look of it. Then there was the fragrance. <laughs> Why do you all assume because it's the content of a toilet bowl, it has to be stinky? This was actually real, you know, earthy, really just common to all beings. And you could, oh, that was amazing, just how ordinary but exquisite there was. Sometimes you have sense, you know, in the sort of your, your uh, to clean up things, air fresheners, you know, women using scent, men using, uh, deodorants, but this was something which was far more closer to earth, real. And I saw that and I was going, wow, wow, wow. As you explored it, it looked more and more delightful. And I did think I should, I can't flush this away. <laughs> I, this has got to be preserved. And it was only because of my training over so many years that I could let go. <laughs> it was difficult. Many times you went to press that button, no, I can't do it. <laughs> Imagine you had this priceless piece of jewelry. Could you throw it away? The most beautiful creation of diamonds and rubies and silver and gold you've ever seen in your life. This was way more beautiful than that. But eventually I did know I had to go give a talk. So I can't, no, did it. <laughs> and the most beautiful piece of shit I'd ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Left my life forever. And that's the amount of letting go a monk has to perform. <laughs> And that was actually a true story. That's what, that's what happens <laughs> when you start to have a beautiful mind. Everything which you see is beautiful.
you see the joy in so many things you thought are absent of anything which is joyful or beautiful or gorgeous. A little animal, snake, a person dying. You can start to see joy and beauty in places you've never expected to see that before. And so your kindness, your metta becomes so incredibly natural and strong. And you can never get upset. This is actually those experiences you get in meditation. You get this wonderful sort of caring for the whole universe. Even the smelly stuff becomes gorgeous. So that's actually what happens in meditation. You see things not like anybody else tells you to see them. No one ever brainwashed me into seeing my own feces as more beautiful than diamonds. But you know that sometimes they look like that? Just a slight bit of mucus on the outside and it sparkled like a diamond. <laughs> I love this way. Why do you always think this is funny, this is real? <laughs> it's not a joke. What's happening here, you're seeing beauty in your mind, everything becomes beautiful. Which means you can hold it and stay with it and really get to know it, investigate it. Tumours on your body. Pain in your body, disappointment in life. You get to see these things in a totally different light. This is where insight is something which is strange. Changes the way you see this world and you become so free of suffering. So anyway, I did want to have a few minutes for Q&A. So I'm going to stop now indulging myself. Let's have a couple of questions before we finish off. Thank you, Ajahn. Your talks always leave me speechless and your similes are always right on point. So thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> At least they're original. <laughs> I mean, you can't see that in one of the Buddha suttas. No. <laughs> okay, Ajahn, first question comes from someone, um, and she came and saw me actually about this question, so it's very personal to her. Her question is this I adopted two children from Vietnam at the end of the war, a brother and a sister. Sadly, the brother was killed in a car accident, and the sister and myself were there. The sister has always been a high achiever, extremely bright and beautiful daughter. She now works in a job where she's always so busy all the time that she's having little time for her family, but most importantly, even for herself. She's exhausted every night and every weekend with no social life. How can I help her find inner peace and create time for herself? Well, you have to, you cannot force her to do that. Invite her. One thing which you can do is actually buy her an air ticket to some nice resort in, say, Vietnam. And you don't just ask, Do you want to go? You just present her with the air ticket and maybe accommodation in some nice resort somewhere. This is a gift you know, from your mother to you. Because if you give them a ticket, it's already paid for. It's very hard to refuse. And that means you're really encouraging them to go. You're not arguing with them, here's a ticket. Put it in a bin if you want, but it costs a lot of money. That's how much I want you to have a rest. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, I've got a few questions that are similar, so I'm going to group them as one. Good, yeah. So uh, these people, they have people they care about, family members who they know are suffering and just really want them to learn the Dhamma, but they don't and they don't have belief in rebirth, for example. So how can these people help reach out to people they care about and share the Dhamma with them when they don't have that interest or are not wanting to? You know that there was this uh, Malaysian lady and she always used to come to my talks in Perth. She had a Western husband and she kept on asking, please look at your kid, 
he's come to see you. It's important. So, always wanted her husband to come and listen to one of the talks and also to learn some meditation, but he kept on refusing. It was typical Australian, didn't believe in any religious nonsense. So, I told her the solution. I said, please go and get one of my books. I think she bought Opening the Door of Your Heart. Take it home and tell your husband, keep your hands off this book, this is very special for me. <laughs> I don't want you to touch it. <laughs> it should be obvious it was a trick, but it, it, she did that and it worked perfectly. <laughs> when she was out shopping somewhere, he thought, who's she saying I can't touch this religious book? <laughs> And so he picked it up, he read the first story, The Two Bad Bricks, I think it was the first story, and read the whole book in one session. Now he comes every week. It worked perfectly. That's one thing to do. And the other thing to do is you keep going to do your meditation. And after a while it makes you to be a very wonderful wife. And he sees that, he can't miss it and then he want to come as well. And so that's how you get people to come. They see the value in it. This one guy, years ago, he always wanted to come on one of these weekend meditation retreats. He asked his wife, weekend retreat, can I go? And she said, no, of course you can't go. We've got to look after the kids. You've got to go to the shopping. You've got to fix up the leaks in the, the garage. No, of course you can't go, it's too busy. And he said, okay. He said, he didn't go. He helped his wife. Next time there was a retreat, there's a retreat on this weekend, darling. Can I go? No, of course you can't go. And the mother-in-law is coming. We've got to prepare the house for this. It's too much work. No, of course you can't go. So he never went. And that happened three or four times. And then once there was a retreat on, there's a retreat on today. It's persistence. Can I go? He said, okay, you go on your stupid retreat and leave me with the kids and the mother-in-law and all the world. You, go, you just go and be selfish. He took that as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> and off he went. And when he came home from that retreat, he was such an improved husband. It'd be like you take in a car which was always difficult to, to drive and it's been tuned up. And she saw the result of that. And the result was so amazing. The next time there was a retreat, you didn't need to ask. And she paid for him and sent him off. <laughs> when you see the results of these retreats, I mean, honestly, I don't need any more people to come on these retreats. It's hard to get everybody in anyway. Many people complain, they book for a retreat and they can't get a place. That's how hard it is. But nevertheless, when you see the results, wow, they're really worthwhile. Tumors disappear. People just understand that they don't need to go through all this trauma of depression. And they can relax more have a much more easier view on life. When it, people realize how much it works, and it is so cheap. The retreats we do over in Perth, we do do a, a booking bond, which is uh, reimbursable. No one ever asks for it back, because they feel they're getting a value for money anyway, really more than value for money. The retreats here, is priceless. So of course, you know, there's no money involved, but a lot of joy and happiness and peace. That's how why you get people to go. They just want to go. They know the benefits. They see the benefits. Okay. Thank you, Ajahn. Dear Ajahn, any advice for primary age siblings arguing and fighting, please? Many thanks. A parent. Okay, look, they have to fight. It's their nature. I would fight with my brother. I would fight with my brother, and I'm going to be a Buddhist monk. 
when I was very, very young, we'd run away from each other, but we couldn't escape. Because we couldn't escape, lived in a small house, we learned how to get on. And so now he became a banker, I became a monk. And even now we're the best of friends. He had two children, a boy and a girl, and they, you know what they call me? Monkle. They do. And it's a nice, it's that kind of a term of endearment. Michael Brown. And they're all proud of me. And it's wonderful to, you know, to even know that I chose a totally different lifestyle. It's still, that's your family. In a family by birth, you'll always care for them. Okay, next question. Okay, next question. If you were to describe a house of Buddha for the elderly, what would be the salient features of it in practical, evident ways? And if I can add to that, I think the person who asked this question um, is part of our community where we're trying to create a Buddhist nursing home. Yeah. Um, so what would be some important features of that? It'd obviously, be like care is the most important part of that. And some autonomy because that's one of the things people find it so difficult to endure, you know, in your old age. You can't even go to the toilet by yourself. You can't wipe your backside. So many of the things other people have to help. It's wonderful you give as much autonomy to the patient or the elderly person, much respect as you possibly can. If it's a Buddhist nursing home, Please, you can always meditate, no matter how sick you are. I was, you know, had that typhus fever. I could still meditate. You don't have to be in any posture. That kindness, that gentleness, those nimittas and jhanas are still inside of you, even when you're old and sick. And if you can actually be encouraged to go deep inside of yourself, it's amazing what that does to any old age symptoms. What that does to your sense of uh, autonomy. And I mean, that gives a great deal of sense of freedom and peace to those people getting old. That's one of the problems, you know, when somebody gets very sick, that's what you lose, your autonomy. You know, the nurses, the doctors tell you what to do all the time. Sorry, I can't resist this story. Ted old Englishman from Lancashire. He was in the hospice, smoking. And he smoked all his life, he didn't know any better. And so he got lung cancer. I went to visit him in the hospice and this is what he told me. The first night there, the nurse asked him, what do you want for dinner tonight, Ted? And Ted replied, I've got diabetes. No, I cannot have anything sugary or sweet. I've got high cholesterol. I can't have anything oily or any fat. I've got hardened arteries. I can't have any salt. And he kept on saying all these things he can't have. And the nurse interrupted him, Ted, you're not going to die of a heart attack. You're going to die of cancer, lung cancer, in about three or four days probably. You can eat whatever you like. And Ted was so surprised. He'd been on his strict low cholesterol, low salt, low sugar diet for about three or four years. And he said, you mean I can eat all these foods which I like but could never eat? Yes, the cancer's going to kill you. You don't have to worry about anything else. <laughs> Ted's eyes went wide and he ordered all this greasy, sweet, syrupy, salty, I don't know, unhealthy food which he wasn't allowed to eat for years. And after about six days, this is no exaggeration, he walked out of that hospice on his own feet without any support he went into remission. 
please never underestimate the joy and the power of joy and happiness to create healing. Six months later, he went into the hospice to die properly. <laughs> we had six months extra to live. And this guy, Ted, I was with him when he actually died, that, uh, you know, the properly. He, have you been with people who are dying? They're laying down there, because his lung cancer, he could hardly breathe, and we thought that was his last breath. <clears throat> and then you start breathing again. I think you've all seen that. And then, you know, I was getting late for my lunch. You've got to eat before midday. Come on, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought that. I can't say that. I can't say that. <laughs> but Ted's daughter knew the problem. She said, look, I'll just go out and get some fast food. Anything, something for you to eat. And like in Australia, fast food has always got like chips with it. And in Lancashire, it had been the tradition for so many years that if you have some chips, you always ask your friends, do you want a chip? Do you want a chip of Karlika? And anyway, his daughter asked her dad, Dad, do you want a chip? And dad opened his eyes and said, yes, I'll have a chip. And that was the last words he ever spoke. <laughs> he died then. <laughs> so be careful of your last words. <laughs> that was Ted's last words. He was a good man, though. Okay. Reminds me, one of the questions in here is uh, how important is that last thought? Just catching on with your last comment just now. Okay, yeah, because this will probably be the last answer to the last question. <laughs> Are you all ready? The point is, there's no such thing as a last thought. Is there any doctors here, any nurses here, any people who have worked? in like palliative care or in hospices, you will know that death is a process which takes many minutes usually. Maybe if there's a sudden death, like an explosion or a big car crash, but most times death takes a while, many moments. And you can't just decide, I'm going to think and a, a nice thought at the very end. It's like your last thoughts are just a condition caused by all the thoughts you've been thinking before. That's why this one Sri Lankan, he wasn't that religious, but he was what we call a Waisak Buddhist. You go to the temple on Waisak, no other day. He was too concerned with his business in Colombo 5. So when he went to the temple on Waisak, he heard the monk say, the most important thing is your last thoughts. If you have beautiful last thoughts, no matter what else you've done, you're guaranteed to go to heaven. And one of the best thoughts you can have as you're dying is on the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, the triple gem. So he wasn't paying attention to anything else, he started thinking how to beat the system. And he found this beautiful method. He had three sons. The next day he went to see his lawyer and by deed poll he changed the name of his three sons to Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. He knew your sons have to be with you on your deathbed. So from that time on, he never went to the temple ever again. Never gave any alms, food, or donations, or anything. Just looked after his business. And all his whole plans were working out exactly as he expected. He was getting sick. And eventually the doctor said, you've only got a few days to go. So his three sons stopped what they were doing were by the bedside. 
and his last minutes of life, he saw his three sons there, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. I'm going to go to heaven. <laughs> and then, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. Then the thought came into his mind. If my three sons are here with me, who's looking after my shop? <laughs> and that's when he died. <laughs> <laughs> you can't beat the system. <laughs> it is your state of mind that creates the last thought. And that last thought, it's the state of mind you've had for a long time before, creates that rebirth. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ajahn. And I hope we haven't worked you too hard these two days. No, I'm still alive. <laughs> Thank you. The next part is Anamodara and dedication of merits. And what we thought would be really nice is for the volunteers who helped with these, <coughs> this event, if you can please make your way to the stage while I make some announcements. So if you can please make your way up um, and we will be able to do some dedication to all of you. So please come up, don't be shy. While that's happening, I'm going to make a few announcements. So importantly, for those who wish to join the retreat tomorrow, we hope that you can come. Go up on the stage, thanks. Um, and also the retreat tomorrow at Santi Forest Monastery, maybe a Nimitta awaits you. And if you are able to help us with transporting things, can you please help us um, with transporting, whether it's items to Santi or people, then if you can see Uncle Lau afterwards, that would be fantastic because we really need your assistance. Feel free to go up and um, get yourself ready. Can you come up? Please come up as soon as possible because we have to wait minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes for all the volunteers to come up. So please, Thank you. all Thank the you. volunteers. Um, also, we do have a feedback form that we'll ask you to complete. Uh, so there is going to be a QR code that's going to be placed on the screen shortly, and we'll ask you to do your feedback as we can improve Any for future. You can see? Um, the next as well is if you would like to come to the gala dinner tonight, we would really love to have you there. We are still selling tickets outside, and it's on at 7 p.m. And finally, we also have another event that's happening in this hall. Meta Centre is organising a Buddhist cultural festival on the 13th of April. And that's a free event and it's going to be amazing. So I hope you can join. I think we now have everyone. And except me. Is this everyone? Okay. All right. So, we don't ladies have and gentlemen. Ajahn Brahm. Where's Tina? Where's Tina? Where is it? Tina? <laughs> I learned something today. <laughs> um, so, venerables, ladies and gentlemen, this is all of the amazing volunteers who have made these, this event possible. So I hope that you could join me in giving them a round of applause. Very good. I can still see some more people who are volunteering not have come up. Please come up. I can see Ranil, Ranil. and there's other, other people. Please, please join us. Right. No escape. <laughs> <laughs> so Ajav, we would like to... Adrian. <laughs> These uh, are special volunteers out there who need us to call them by name to invite them. <laughs> And Ajahn, we would love for you to lead us in an Anamodana and dedication of merits in whichever way you wish. Okay, so the Anamodana, Sabha Buddha no Bowena. Here we go. Please, monks and nuns, please chant loudly along with us. <clears throat> Sabha Buddha no Bowena, Sabha Dhamma, Nubawena Saba Sangha Nubawena Buddha Ratanang Dhamma Ratanang Sangha Ratanang Tinang Ratananang Anubawena Chatura Siti Sahasa Dhamma 
May all the good merits of today be dedicated to our departed relations without whom we would not be here. So we think of the merits we've had of knowing such people, uh, people we loved, we cared for, and who cared for us. May they share with the merits which we've made today. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu. Big one. Sadhu. <laughs> Very good. Thank you all. <laughs>